death threats and was forced to live in hiding. And he was stabbed to death on the streets of Amsterdam. His last words, mercy, mercy. We can talk about it, can't we? Not without paying a high price, it seems. Let's bring it closer to home. In spite of the First Amendment, our conversations about Islamic terrorism have been stifled too. When journalists wrote about the Islamic Society of Boston, a mosque founded by Al-Qaeda operative, affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood, and attended by the Boston bombers, ISB, the Islamic Society of Boston, sued the journalists in an attempt to intimidate them into silence. When Congressman Cass Bollinger reported that the Council on Islamic, uh, American Islamic Relations was fundraising arm for Hezbollah, he was also sued, even though the judge agreed that he was fully within his rights to speak publicly about CARE's ties to militant Islam. When dozens of non-Muslims were singled out to be massacred in a Kenyan shopping mall by the Islamist terror group Al-Shabaab, 90% of the top 10 daily newspapers censored the words Islam and Muslim from the headlines reporting the attack. When Major Nidal Hassan went on a murdering spree in Fort Hood, the United States government classified his act of terrorism as workplace violence with no reference to his religious motivation, not mentioning him screaming, Allah is great, as he gunned down 13 fellow students and wounded 32 more. Nothing is said about essays he had written arguing for the painful punishment and liquidation of non-Muslims. References to Islam and jihad have been removed from the FBI's training manuals, while materials tying al-Qaeda to the 1993 World Trade Center bombing and linking the Muslim Brotherhood to terrorism have been eliminated. The East, Europe, the U.S., even the U.N., the conversation about militant Islam is being systematically suppressed. For more than 10 years, the Human Rights Council in the, United, in the U.N. has been co-opted by the organic, or Organization of Islamic Cooperation into passing yearly resolutions directing U.N. member states to prohibit speeches offensive to religion, specifically Islam. The scary part? These events are just a small example of what's already happening. The phenomenon is called lawfare. It's threatening, suing, censoring, even, even attacking anyone bold enough to speak openly about the threat of militant Islam. Creating a society where freedom of speech is exchanged for fear of it. Either we have a conversation about this now, or we may never, ever be able to have it. It's a great, great video. They did a great job of it, on it. Uh, I'm going to make sure it stays at the top of the uh, website for some time now. Okay, moving on. Um, let's see. Let's go to Oklahoma. CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. People, Egypt has declared this to be a Muslim Brotherhood front group. This is a terrorist organization. The United Arab Emirates has declared this a Muslim Brotherhood front group. It is a terrorist organization. The United States had it declared as a Muslim Brotherhood front group, a terrorist organization, until Barack Hussein Obama took office, and he removed the designation. He's brought more Muslims into his administration than have ever been employed in any administration in history. And now, Abercrombie and Fitch had interviewed a young gal. She was 16 at the time. And she applied for a job as a sales clerk. Now, these sales clerks are actually called models. And they wear clothes and they wear their hair. They look like the people that buy their clothes. It's a sales image. It's important to Abercrombie and Fitch. 
guys aren't allowed to wear black jeans and black T-shirts. That's not the style that Abercrombie and Fitch want. This girl came in wearing a black hijab, wearing a black headscarf, didn't get the job. And she filed an equal opportunity suit against them. And in 2011, a federal jury awarded her $20,000 in compensatory damages. This is a scam. If you know you're not going to get hired wearing the hijab, you go to apply. You get turned down. You sit at home watching TV and making um, exploding prayer mats. And you sue and you make as much money as you would have if you had the job. It's a scam, people. Well, in 2013, a federal appeals court ruled against her because she did not explicitly say that she was Muslim and she would need religious exemption from the dress code. The EOC has appealed that decision to the Supreme Court, which will hear the case later next week. Meanwhile, the Council on Islamic American Islamic Relations is defending this woman. They are being her legal arm to sue businesses to force us to hire them. Folks, stay with us. We still got a whole lot more coming up. All aboard the Inland Empire Express. 1050 AM, leaving no listeners behind. KCAA. Tom O'Halloran. Holding the line against tyranny from Washington, D.C. I am America, one voice, united we stand. I am America, one hope to heal our land. There is still work that must be done. I will not rest until we be Welcome back. This is the Fastest Hour in Radio. This is Jihad on America, and I'm your host, Tom O'Halloran. Uh, just before the break, we're talking about CARE, C-A-I-R, that's the Council on American Islamic Relations, suing everybody about everything having to do with Islam. If you don't like it, they will sue you. A proposed mega mosque. We were just talking about mega mosques a few minutes ago. A little town of Bridgewater, New Jersey, near the shore, rejected a mosque being built in a housing area. Their zoning board has decreed that all houses of worship, now it didn't say all mosques, it said all houses of worship are to be built on the main thoroughfares. Like most towns, they want neighborhoods to be quiet peaceful, less traffic. This is what zoning ordinances are all about. But these Muslims weren't happy with that, so they went crying to care. Now, my guess is they knew they couldn't get away with building it there, which is why they tried it. These people try things they know they can't get away with. When they're told no, they sue. This is how they're forcing us to change to their ways. And judges will grant them what they want because the judges are afraid of their family being beheaded. Because these murdering bastards do that. If you tick them off, they will cut your family's heads off. It's what they do. So they went to CARE and CARE sued. Actually, CARE didn't sue. CARE went to their legal firm, the DOJ. Yes, it used to be the Department of Justice. It's now the Department of Jihad. Obama's racist-in-chief, Eric Holder, actually sued the town of Bridgewater. We have U.S. federal tax dollars being used to sue a small town so that Muslims can build a mosque where they want, not where the town wants. This is insane. And if you don't have blood starting to squirt out of your eyes now, then you need to cut back on your meds because this should just tick you off. No church can build a church in a neighborhood in this town. That's what the rules say. 
But if Eric Holder sued, and they're forcing this township to pay five million dollars to the people, plus buy another piece of land for one point or two point seven five million dollars. So a total of seven point seven five million dollars. This small town has to kick out so that the mosque can build a mosque where they were supposed to have built it to begin with. Can you imagine? Uh, Imagine going downtown, downtown Los Angeles, finding a vacant lot and saying that you're going to build a pig farm here. When the city council says, no, we're not allowing pig farms in our downtown business district. You get a large law firm with deep pockets, and they sue the town for you. And then you win $7.75 million, and you go out in the country, and you buy the the lot, and you build your pig farm with the town's money. There is no reason in the world that this judge should have allowed this order to come down. There weren't Catholic churches built in neighborhoods. You don't see Lutherans. They didn't have Jewish temples in these neighborhoods. All houses of worship were designated to the main thoroughfares. And it's insane that these Islamic scumbags, these followers of the goat-raping pedophile named Mohammed, force their way into our society, steal our tax dollars, through lawsuits, and even worse, it's all paid for with our tax dollars because Eric Holder and Hussein Obama are going along with it. The Department of Justice had no business sticking their nose into that lawsuit. It's absolutely insane. Oh. Article online this week by Rachel... Molsky says that the religion of peace shows how peaceful they have been. In a new study of jihadi attacks and the resulting deaths, Islamic terror attacks have resulted in over 5,000 deaths in 14 countries in one month. In one month. In the month of November, last month alone, 664 attacks in 14 countries. 16 jihadi groups were responsible for the bloodshed. Islamic State was the deadliest group, launching 308 attacks across Iraq and Syria, leaving 2,206 people dead, 44% of the fatalities. Boko Haram in Nigeria and Cameroon, including the kidnapping of more than 250 schoolgirls. They carried out only 30 attacks, but they were large and deadly, killing 800 people. Some 151 incidents were attributed to the Taliban in Afghanistan and Pakistan, in which 720 people died. Four countries worse affected by jihadist strikes, Iraq, Nigeria, Syria, and Afghanistan, accounted for 4,031, or 80% of all deaths. Iraq bore the brunt with 1,700 people, 1,770, mostly military or civilian killed, followed by Nigeria, 786, Afghanistan, 782, and Syria, 693. Other nations terribly blighted by Jihadist terrorism included Yemen, 410, Somalia, 212, and Pakistan, 212, where al-Qaeda offshoots operate with deadly menace. Why these people are allowed to move and expatriate and immigrate into other countries is beyond me. It's obvious what these people are up to, what they do, what they're all about. 
Oh, let's see. What do we have next? 